everyone, and welcome to another episode of God Saul's Turnbuckle, the wrestling video podcast here on YouTube. Um, you know, uh, we'll get around the other formalities and everything in that sense. We know I'm trying to work on a few other things. That's down the line here, and now we are going through Monday Night Raw on July 17th, 2017, and this was the episode of Monday Night Raw where Kurt Angle was supposed to reveal his uh, dirty little secret, which basically, well, was basically just a you know extra plot point for down the road. I'll talk about that a little bit later on in, in the actual show itself. So they started off the show with what I thought was actually a really good, uh, really good segment. It started off with Dean Ambrose, he's calling out the Miz and gang, everything in that, that sense. And uh, instead of getting Miz, he, uh, in his Miz Taraj, uh, he gets Seth Rollins. Uh, and they continue building this tension between Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose about what happened years ago, everything in that sense. You even got to a point where Seth Rollins says he's sorry. And he even like turns his back to him and is like, okay, this make you feel better. Just go ahead and hit me with a chair. I don't care. Like, the the tension that they were building between both, uh, both of them, I thought was really good. It came off really well, and it came off, uh, it came off great with what they were doing and teases them, you know, working together down the line. Uh, this does eventually have Miz and the Miztourage come out. They basically go through and, uh, you know, Miz cuts a promo, and they basically beat down both Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose as they go, to, uh, and then of course end out leaving. With uh, Miz and them actually leaving the building a little bit later on, like they were going somewhere. We don't know what exactly this was, but um, yeah, just went uh, other places with it. Uh, so yeah, overall I ended up liking the segment, and actually set up for another segment a little bit later where you had Ambrose and Rollins backstage. They were both bickering again about what was going on down there. Everything in that sense, which actually brought Kurt Angle in um, to basically make uh, what was going to be essentially a tag match, and then Dean Ambrose was like, yeah, no, we'll take on all three. And it's like, okay, three on two handicap match. Good to go. Next week. Yeah, that, that happened. Uh, that happened with that one. Um, so that, and that, la that backstage segment wasn't all that great. I low, like again, like I was saying again, uh, I like the aspect of the tension that they're building between Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose, uh, to go along with this. And maybe this does lead to some kind of heel turn for Ambrose or something in that sense. I don't know exactly where they're going to go with this. Uh, obviously I, I can only predict where the, or I can only try to make a prediction. It would seem to lead to a Dean Ambrose heel turn somewhere down the line, but we'll see how in, how everything ends up going out. So for uh, so for the first match of the night, it was actually Bailey going up against Alexa Bliss. Um, match itself uh, was a decent enough one. I thought the match was a pretty decent match between both of them. They do have Nia Jax and Sasha Banks get involved in the match itself. Nia comes out earlier on, and as it looks like um, she's going to help Alexa win, uh, Sasha comes out and dispatches of Nia Jax um, by attacking her and then like drop kicking her into the actual ring apron itself. Instead of doing the typical spot where you get hoisted up um, above somebody, she does do that. She falls back with uh, Nia, catches herself, and then gets caught with that with that drop kick. Uh, and they have Bailey go over again. And it's like it, it's one of those little um, little shocking bits that they do there. It's like, wait a minute, Bailey went over again. Okay, uh, it's like it was one of those okay moments because again, they it made it feel like that they were going in a route that Bailey was going to be way away from the title picture for a little bit, but now they're kind of hoisting her back into it really quickly again uh, to go along with it. And this did lead again to another backstage segment, which I wasn't the biggest fan of, but again, it let and if they decide to give this match time. They decided to give this match time. I know they're building up for it for next week, so you would assume they're going to give it time. Uh, Kurt Angle made a number one contendership match with both Bailey and Sasha Banks, uh, which the segment was basically is like, okay, Bailey's beaten, uh, beaten Alexa twice in the last two weeks, but Sasha got cheated out of her. Uh, her match with um, Alexa Bliss from the pay-per-view. So they were trying to determine, they were both kind of arguing over who would be number one contender. And Kurt was like, number one contendership match, go. 
and, and done uh, with it. Uh, that's again the the backstage segments. I was not the biggest fan of for, for setting up both of these matches, but uh, like I said, if time given to this match, what we've seen before in NXT, this could be a really good match. <laughs> this could be a really good match if they give this one time uh, to go along with it. Uh, so before we get into everything, like I said, I'll. What was the next segment that we had? We had a couple backstage segments in here. One was with Kurt Angle because they had uh, done a bit where Corey Graves had gotten up uh, again. They did the typical thing. It was like they were about to do some talking. Corey Graves gets up and is like, I've got to take, go take care of something type thing. And both Booker T and uh, Michael Cole just look at him like, okay, <laughs> uh, type thing. Uh, this did lead to a Kurt Angle segment where he's having second thoughts on doing uh, revealing his secret, everything in that sense. But Corey Graves ends out talk, talking him into it again. So, uh, like, I feel like, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, I feel like these little nip, nip uh, uh, little segments with Corey doesn't necessarily end with the reveal tonight it's somewhere down the line a little bit further along like i feel like this reveal and i'll talk about it a little bit later ends out being like um a, a little piece of what's actually going to end up be going on like where are they going to be going with this down the line um so after that segment though you had apollo cruz titus o'neill and akira tozawa backstage basically um you know, Titus is giving everyone a pep talk backstage about Titus Worldwide, everything in that sense. And Titus is great on the microphone. Uh, I have actually been really enjoying what he's been doing uh, as of late. But they end up getting interrupted by Arya Davari, uh, which, which he basically had... Um, he was angry over the 205 Live segment, where, or 205 Live match with him and Akira Tozawa, where Neville had interfered, and he said it was costing him the match, everything in that sense. And he challenged a Tozawa to a match later that night, which, of course, Tozawa ends out accepting. Um, and this actually does lead into... Our first cruiserweight match of the night, which, uh, interesting note, they have made this, uh, they've made a, an aesthetic change to the cruiserweight matches. Usually on Raw, the, um, the aesthetic would be they would switch the ropes to being purple real quick, they would switch the apron to say cruiserweights, everything in that sense, and then you would have the other signs saying this is cruiserweight action. Now... Uh, this week, I don't know if this is just going to be a one-week thing or it's going to be a full-on thing down the line. They're switching it to where they don't change the ring apron and they don't change the ropes. That could be a full-on aesthetic thing that they decide to keep on doing on Raw and they actually do the switches over on uh, when they do 205 Live. Or it was just a one-week thing and they decided not to go along with it. I personally like the aesthetic change on Raw because it makes it feel like it's part of well, Monday Night Raw, it doesn't feel like it was like, this is in its own little bubble elsewhere. Uh, they've kind of now intertwined both the 205 Live stuff and the Monday Night Raw stuff. And, and keeping the ropes the same and the mat the same and everything in that sense, with the exception that it says on the Titantron, this is a Cruiserweight match, it makes it feel like it's actually part of the show uh, itself. And in, I do like the aesthetic change. I hope they keep that going throughout the uh, upcoming weeks. So with the cru first Cruiserweight match of the night, which was Brian Kendrick and Drew Gulak going up against Mustafa Ali and Jack Gallagher, um, this was an all right match. The crowd, they haven't, most of this crowd haven't seen most of these guys in quite some time. So at least in the terms of the Monday Night Raw crowd, they have not seen them in quite some time. Um... And they were doing a little bit of promoting the fact that Mustafa Ali and Drew Gulak are having a two out of three falls match, everything in that sense, uh, to go uh, for the next night on 205 Live. Um, it, it was an alright match. It was an okay match. It just felt like it was there, though. That's basically all it was. It just felt like it was there uh, in that sense of everything. So, uh, up next was Enzo um, uh, and you know, basically Enzo Amore coming out after he had been beaten down from uh, the Great Balls of Fire pay-per-view. He cuts another promo on Cass, which eventually Big Cass interrupts, and he starts cutting a promo on Enzo to go along with everything. Enzo uh, kind of ducks out of the ring, 
And he says, it's like, I'm going to sit over here and watch what's about to happen because uh, something's about to happen to you. And it was the big show coming out, just like the week before. And they brawl for what seemed to be an extensive period of time. Like, they had a back and forth. Like, it was, it felt like it should have been a match in, in some way, shape, or form. But they brawl on the outside. They brawl in the ring. Some back and forth, which eventually has Cass coming out on top and him actually giving a big boot to Enzo Amore again. So, um, the, the segment, I felt just... It went on for an extensive period of time that felt like it was taking forever to get to where they were going uh, in this one, which was putting Cass over, which from the week before they didn't necessarily do. They had basically kind of uh, made Cass to kind of run away from Big Show. Now he stands up the Big Show this week uh, to go along with it. So... Oh no, I'm not the biggest fan of that segment. Uh, mainly just due to the amount of time. It was a long period of time before you even had referees trying to do anything to separate uh, anybody there in any way. If, they, if I even remember them even having referees come out to try to separate the two of them in any way, shape, or form. Uh, yeah, the segment took an extensive period of time. I like the promo from Enzo. But, again, it, it was like a long, long period of time uh, for, uh, for that segment to actually finish up. Uh, so, up next was Roman Reigns with the, doing a quick interview about the match. Basic promo. Nothing really too much to talk about there. Uh, so, it, you know, it was just setting up, uh, setting up more for the match later that night with him and Samoa Joe. Uh, so, this brings us to um, the Elias Sampson versus Finn Balor match. Again, Elias Sampson doing very good work, uh, talking before the match and everything. I like how he's getting interrupted now. He's getting interrupted more and more during his song. It's like the beforehand was like people weren't interrupting him or anything like that. So now he basically gets interrupted on a weekly basis uh, with this one. Uh, the match itself, uh, it was kind of stand, it was kind of same fare from last week, and you thought it was like, oh, this is where they're going again. They have Finn win again or something in that sense. No, they decide uh, it was going standard fare with how everything was going until they get to the outside and. Uh, Elias Sampson ends out using his guitar on Finn Balor to cause a disqualification and the, the the guitar shot that they used. Now, way back when, you could tell they gimmicked the guitar for tonight. Like, they've always gimmicked the guitar, especially when Jeff Jarrett was doing everything in that sense uh, with everything. But since they don't allow chair shots to the or like shots to the head as much anymore he had to hit him in the shoulder uh with everything which caused the uh, gimmick guitar to actually cut open finn balor on his head because uh the bottom portion of the guitar kind of smashed it into his head after it didn't gimmickly fully break away and actually busted him open in the match it actually kind of looked pretty good uh it, it looked like a very brutal guitar shot um, but in the terms of safety, I don't, <laughs> I think it, oddly enough, with the gimmick guitars, it's safer to go, oh my god, safer to actually aim for the head. Which is kind of sad, because that one usually never caused blood, never really usually caused a concussion or anything in that sense. This one is like, the portion of the gimmick guitar didn't break off, so it busted open, um, it busted them open. It's like, uh, in that sense of everything, maybe they should have aimed for the back or something and to go along with it. I don't know, but that's how it ended out. It was one of those bits like, wow, the other way actually looks safer. That's kind of sad to say. It's really sad to say on that one, uh, in that sense. So after the match, Finn Balor gets in the ring. He gets interrupted by random Bray, Br Wyatt, Bray Wyatt promo and basically Bray's going after Finn Balor now. It's getting to the point that with Bray, I like the character, I like where, I like the promos, I like this stuff, but there doesn't seem to be a actual purpose to his madness. He just goes after people randomly. Now, I mean, he goes over on Seth, and is this going to lead to Bray Wyatt, cult leader, whatever you want to call him now? Um, going up against the demon, which is what you would probably kind of expect uh, down the line. So it, it, it was one of those bits. It's like, okay, that's cool, 
you teased this a while ago and it actually you had actually set up a promo that made sense for him to go after Bray, uh, like for Bray to go after Finn, but this one didn't really make all that much sense. Uh, what was it? Next, you had the Revival cutting a promo on the Hardys and basically their match, saying it's like, you know, they're in the past, we are the now, we don't even care what they did in the past type thing. I, and I like the Revival. I like how they cut their promos, and it came off really good here, basically setting up for their uh, match later in the evening with uh with the hardys uh so this actually leads into akira tozawa going up against aria davari again they don't make the aesthetic change i'm liking it um this match was actually interesting i liked where they went with this one and you saw it in a uh, backstage segment a little bit later so uh aria davari was working over akira tozawa's shoulder the entire match everything in that sense and like it was getting to the point it's like okay it's getting almost a little bit uncomfortable even to the point that um titus says no no he done he's forfeiting the match he's forfeiting the match and all right Afari ends up getting the victory which makes akira tozawa angry at um titus o'neill because he, he's saying he'll never quit he'll never quit anything that the go along with it and uh as he's storming off uh backstage so like really angry at titus for you know forfeiting the match because he doesn't want to quit he doesn't want he wants to you know see the match out to the end um which led to a backstage segment with titus and akira tozawa basically him saying it's like i'll never quit and like to, uh, you had titus going like i know that i'm cons i was like i was concerned for your future everything in that sense so it's like titus showing concern for his clients to go along with the, trying to get them opportunities as well and he said it's like don't worry we're gonna get uh, we're gonna get that one back and we're gonna go after the cruiserweight title and everything in that sense and Tazawa is like you're absolutely okay you're absolutely right I want to match t on 205 live tomorrow night against Arya Davari so it's probably gonna see you're probably gonna see another match with Arya Davari and um, Akira Tazawa uh, on 205 live so I actually liked that. I thought that was good stuff. Uh, decent storytelling and building up for the future with uh, with this whole Akira Tozawa and uh, Titus O'Neil thing that they're going on with. So, before we talk about uh, the Hardys and the Revival and the main event, up next was the Kurt Angle reveal. He comes out and he's going to tell every uh, he's going to tell the world a secret, everything in that sense, and they basically made this come off as everything ends up being okay for Kurt Angle in the end. Like, the company's behind him, the family's behind him, he even announces, like, the company was behind him, the, his family's behind him on this announcement and everything. He tells a story about a person he had dated in college, and when they had broken up, she did not tell him about the fact that she gave birth nine months later, everything in, in that sense, and that he has an illegitimate child. Um, so it came off in that, in that sense. And that illegitimate child, of course, is going to be conveniently a WWE superstar. Uh, and it ends up being, and there was a lot of aspects of it that they went with, uh, that like people were saying, it was like, oh, if they're doing that, it's going to be like Chad Gable or somebody else. They end up making it Jason Jordan, which actually in the set, in the, the time frame that they gave, which was like during his college time. Jason Jordan's age actually coincides with it, which is pretty good. Uh, it's good touch that they put in there that they made it actually kind of coincide with the time frame that they gave. Uh, it's a nice attention to detail and everything in that sense. The only problem that I actually have with the segment, um, they built up to this reveal to be like almost the climax. And it comes off as kind of, eh? Just ho-hum. It doesn't come off as like, Okay, it's like they're making it feel like it's like oh, his family's behind uh, behind this whole thing. His um, the company's behind this whole thing and everything in that sense. Nothing bad's gonna happen to Kurt. So it makes it feel like that down the line, this is just another piece to the story. Again, with like with the whole thing with Corey Graves as well. It's just a piece of the story that they're going for down the line here whether it leads into a SummerSlam thing or if it leads into something else 
uh, or a WrestleMania thing. It feels like it would be more of a WrestleMania thing than it would be for SummerSlam because it feels like with this storyline, they're kind of taking their time with it and letting it just build. So I guess for the time being, it's going to be a bit where, you know, Jason Jordan's going to be on Raw, Kurtz is his, his actual dad, so he's going to probably do some father figure stuff and everything to go along with it, and maybe try to help him out or something in that sense down the line. And maybe it, it maybe it's a thing where it kind of builds tension in the locker room. It's like, hey, you're giving him, your son, so many opportunities that you're not giving other people or anything in that sense. We'll see where this story ends out going and what segments we get out of this to go along with it. But in the end, they had built this up to be like the big thing, the big climax, and it feels like it's just a little nugget of the story itself. And we'll see where they end up going down the line with this one. I, uh, in the end, it was like, uh, I, okay, I get it. I get it, and it wasn't too bad. At least it wasn't like a bit where they tried to have Dixie Carter come out or something in that sense and try anything with that down the line or something yeah something in that sense so it'll be interesting to see where this one ends out going now so this brings us to the last oh well, basically the last two matches tonight because i had talked about some of the other segments that were in there already uh so it was the hardys going up against the revival this is a good match this was a good match i actually thoroughly enjoyed this match from beginning to end and the aspect of the revival going over as well I like that one as well. I like that aspect. Um, it builds up the revival as a big on uh, a bigger threat. Um, the Hardys don't come off as necessarily broken yet, but maybe this builds tension between the Hardys and eventually leads to the breakup. And if they ever do get the rights to it, it leads to Matt becoming, you know, the broken character. Everything in that sense. Maybe we we see Jeff kind of uh, reimagine the uh, whole th the brother Nero. Uh, character from uh, Impact Wrestling as well. We'll see where they go with it. The match itself, like I said, was just a fun, enjoyable match. Like, points where you, uh, you know, you thought, like, okay, the Hardys are going to win this one. And then one of the Revival makes the save or something uh, something in that sense. I, matter of fact, I think they even hit the, uh, the pseudo combo of the twist of fate into the uh, Swanton Bomb, and then one of the Revival members makes the save. It, they did some really good stuff here, and I rather I did rather enjoy this particular tag team match. I thought it was a really good match. So this leads into the main event, which was Roman Reigns versus Samoa Joe. The, the, these two put on good matches. I'm not going to lie. I, I'm not going to lie to it. These two put on good matches. This was another good one that they were putting on. Uh, and they're good teasing of who's going to win the match from uh, both sides towards the end, everything in that sense. And then you have both of them down, just kind of struggling to get back up. And then that's when it becomes a no contest because Braun! Braun comes back eight days after being almost murdered. We'll just leave it at that. We'll just leave it at that. He, did, he, he had his uh, right arm taped up everything in that sense. Uh, from uh, and, and selling it a little bit still not selling it as much as probably actually feasible but uh, he comes out and essentially destroys both guys like to the point that I, like Samoa Joe and Roman Reigns stop focusing on each other and Samoa Joe even tries to help out and try to beat this monster which they get a little bit of a uh, an advantage, but they don't get to keep the advantage throughout the entire thing. And you have, it just builds up Braun and it builds up Joe and it builds up Reigns to go along with it. In, in that sense uh, of everything, like you have both of these guys clashing against each other throughout the entire thing. Uh, throughout the entire match, and then Braun comes out and destroys, uh, starts destroying them, and the, the both of them was like, okay, we got to put this aside for a br brief moment to try to beat them down, which they couldn't do, and Braun ends out standing tall in the end. Um, I like the segment. Um, kind of predictable. Uh, kind of predict, you know, like the ending of this, and oddly enough, they may do it again with Bailey and, and Sasha Banks next week as well. It was kind of predictable that Braun comes out, ends the match, no contest, and 
we have something for down uh, like that sets up a fatal four way or something in that sense for SummerSlam. There's a chance that they do that again next week, which is like okay, you just did that once. Like why don't you just have someone win in the in, in this case uh, of everything? But uh, we'll see where they decide to go with that particular match. Uh, with this one, it's kind of leading towards the fatal four way that uh, the fatal four way that they're going with um, as well with Roman Reigns, Brock Lesnar, Samoa Joe, and Braun Strowman. And, and again, like I said, there's also now rumor that there's going to be a fatal four way with the women's title for Raw as well uh, at the at SummerSlam, which leads us to think is uh, leads me to think is like we'll see this again next week with Sasha and Bailey uh, as well, and they'll in interject Nia Jax into it or something in that sense uh so overall um this Raw had ups and downs I thought overall it wasn't all that great of a show though it's like they had one really good thing about uh, about a portion of it and then they would have a backstage segment setting up something for the next week that didn't really come off all that well uh but at least it leads into something for next week and they're you know, promoting something for next week uh, to go along with it. Like, we have the three-on-two handicap match with the Miz Taraj and the Miz going up against Ambrose and Rollins. Does that lead to a potential heel turn for Dean Ambrose? They set up Sasha Banks and Bailey for next week as well. Um, like I said, they give that match time. We've seen what they can do in NXT. Let them do that here. I'm just saying. Just saying. Let them try to do that he, uh, uh, on the main roster to go along with it. And that match will end up being good. But also, I mean, we just had a number one contendership match that just ended with this. And there's a chance that that match ends that way too. Just saying. We'll see where everything's go uh, everything goes with um, with everything. And yeah, I mean, overall, like I said, I wasn't the biggest fan of this Monday Night Raw. But well, like I said, we got the good match with uh, the Hardys and the Revival. The match quality itself, I thought it was pretty f it was fine throughout the entire night. Uh, it was just kind of it felt standard fare for the most part. Uh, in some cases, it, it, well, not in some cases, in most cases, it felt like it was standard fare. I like the stuff that they had with Akira Tozawa and uh, Arya Davari, and then the stuff with Tozawa and Titus O'Neil to go along with it. I thought it was really good. I thought the main event was good as well, um, but the whole bit with Braun coming out, kind of predictable. And I'm not saying predictable in a bad way. It's just, it's kind of where people thought it was going. And I thought it actually came off rather good as well. It at least came off good. Um, when are we going to get the Broken Hardys? Whenever legal stuff ends uh, to go along with it. So, with that being said, everyone, that's another episode of God Saul's Turnbuckle. I've got, that's pretty much all I have for Monday Night Raw this week. I thank you guys for watching, and I hope you have a great day.